going to hear from Lo Rosa Lowinger down here in Miami. Uh, she's going to be covering also salvage and recovery part two, objects and sculpture. So without further ado, I'm going to hand the mic over to Rosa Lowinger. And uh, I'm going to continue from where Francoise left off. And some of the material that I'm presenting overlaps a bit, so I'll go through my slides a bit quickly. Um, there's a lot of information in these slides, but I figured it would be better to have it on the slide so you can go back and revisit it later. So let's see. Okay, as we discuss, what is a disaster? A disaster is something that you're not expecting, and it's often of catastrophic proportions, even if it's small. And you can see some of the types of disasters. They can be, as Francoise said, related to a specific part of a building or an entire building, or it could be citywide, and obviously, or region-wide. Obviously, the bigger the disaster, the harder it will be able to provide services because not only will other institutions be competing for those same services, but you yourselves will probably be in a position that uh, of having to protect your homes and your your lives. So one of the things that I think is really important is to create relationships not only within the region that you're in, but in other regions. So for example, the fact that this is going on in three different parts of Florida is very valuable because chances are that the entire state would not be hit by an event. But even if it is, it would be worthwhile connecting with some of your colleagues in other parts of the country. Um, so there are events that can be prepared for, hurricanes, storms, you usually know that they're coming and these kinds of plans are very good for both things that can be prepared for and not prepared for, but particularly for those events like a hurricane. Right now there's a hurricane threatening the entire East Coast and we should be thinking about the possibility of what happens if that hurricane turns inward and where would we begin. We have a little bit of time with hurricanes that we don't with things like earthquakes, uh, sudden fires, windstorms, flash floods. So I'm not going to go through this whole thing here because we have a lot of material to cover, but the building itself, whether it's a historic or non-historic building, there's many things you can do to just protect the building from damage. One very simple thing that often is neglected is just to make sure the flashing is clear, that, uh, the, fl that the roof flashing is clear and can drain properly, the gutters, um, that materials are stored away from pipes, that materials are off the floor. Another thing that I saw once, I was involved in a disaster recovery in Havana in 1994 when there was a major storm surge that came over the seawall and there was a collection, an ethnographic collection at Casa de las Americas where they were prepared for the event and what they did is they put the entire collection on tables but what happened is the storm surge came in at six feet and the tables floated and dumped everything onto the surface. So the only way you'd ever learn that is to experience it. But now that I experienced it, you know that if water can come into your building, keeping things off the floor isn't enough. You have to make sure those tables are weighted so they won't float. So have a look at this later. Obviously, as Francoise said, preparation is the key to recovery. Maintaining a list of conservators and other vendor contacts. It's very important. We talk a lot about freezing, but right now, if you had to think about freezing, would you even know where to begin? I mean, I have a freezer in my studio, but it would fit maybe five objects. So if you are making your plan, know which vendors you're going to want to contact. In South Florida, there are some very good and and a number of, of good um, art handling firms but if imagine if there's a big disaster event here they're all going to be maxed out so you should know what those firms are who who they are who to contact but also think about some smaller vendors that could help you out with what you need um, and again, if you're in a disaster-prone area that's prone to a particular type of disaster for example if you're in a seismic region just know that your collections are being um, uh, uh, installed and protected in storage in a way that is appropriate. For example, um, my firm which has offices in Miami and Los Angeles, in our Los Angeles office, all of the pieces that we work on, we are very careful never to leave them overnight um, without having them strapped down or sandbagged, which we don't necessarily do here until the day we have an earthquake here and then we'll change those <laughs> practices. And again, practicing. And, and get the and, and learn the lessons from prior 
events. Um, obviously the Florence flood of 1966 was a massive event that a lot of people learned a lot from and that is kind of the beginning of where we really start to understand ways of taking care of uh, pieces during disaster. The Huntington Library fire of 1985 um, which I showed a brief picture of there is the entire recovery is published online. So okay, so what happens the first um, the first thing that happens after an event, as Francoise said, you're going to have to wait for the first responders to let you into the building. You're going to be wanting to get in there, and they're going to keep you out of there because they're going to want to make sure that human safety is is really a accounted for. And structures that are in fires or have been in water events are really are really susceptible to all types of damage that are not even really self-evident. And this is just a small list of them. When you are actually allowed back in the building, even if the first responders say you can go in, if you see anything that feels wrong, you should make contact with whoever the supervising person on site is because the last thing anybody wants is um, collections people buried in a building that's been compromised. So while the site is being secured and while you're gaining access, this is the time to really gather your senses and gather your staff. And um, again, as Francoise said, you have to have a really clear chain of command, know who is responsible, and have that person be in charge. And I would recommend that within institutions, you look very carefully at who has project management skills, who's cool under pressure. You don't want, even if your director of collections is the person that should be in charge, if that's a person that's like nervous and not good under pressure, that is not who you want in charge. Whoever's making those decisions should select like a real leader. And you should select more than one because you never know I mean, that is to say you should have a flow chart of if that person's not available, who is available, because that person's house may have had their roof collapse and has no water or clothes or access to anything, so they're not going to be available to you. So really, in a, for a large-scale event, you want to have more than one person in your chain of command and really look to project management skills and leadership for that individual, somebody who can co control a team and be flexible about um, doing the work. One other thing that I always like to tell people that um, when you're preparing for this, and there's going to be um, a session this afternoon on materials and what you want, one of the things that I think is most important to have on site is bottled drinking water for a number of reasons. If you need, when, when you're working a disaster and you're working quickly and you're putting in amazingly long hours, the possibility of getting dehydrated is really great. And if you're wearing a respirator, for long periods of time, when you take that respirator off, the first thing you want to do is wipe your face down with some kind of like a like a wipe, and then drink some water. And that's something you know in your in your disaster kits to have that available. Obviously, safety first. You got to know what you're dealing with. You got to take the safety precautions. And of course, once you're able to get into the building, it's going to be all systems go. You're going to need to balance that desire to work quickly to save objects with staying safe. And the safety equipment, you can peruse this later, but very important to have the right kind of respirators for the right kind of task. And hard hats, you know, we all are cavalier about hard hats. I'm as bad as the next person, but even though you don't think that you need a hard hat, just in wandering around when you're seeing things that are unstable, it's really helpful to have a hat that protects your head. Um, also, okay, so know what you're encountering. People sometimes think when you have a fire that it's just a fire, but a fire is a mix of different things. Um, when you are, uh, you're going to have soot in that, in that fire, but you're also going to have probably water in that fire. The other thing too, and this is unfortunate, but any building that was built or retrofitted from 1930 to 1977 is probably going to have asbestos in it. And so that means that your um, masks are going to have to account for that and your, your entire equipment is going to have to account for that. Obviously you're going to have mold in the air, but you might have mold and asbestos and um, uh, soot and you might also find that you have lead paint if the buildings were built before 1977. Here's a list of other things to be alert for and again you know, just some simple things such as that mud's going to make the surface slippery, so know what kind of shoes you're wearing. Um, 
be able to wipe your masks down, um, know when you're cleaning up your building, especially your historic building, that you're going to want to clean inside. You know, If water and mud gets in, it's going to get into every cavity, including the open electrical outlets. So as the building starts to be fixed, you're going to have to look into those areas as well as not only sources of um, uh, mud, but mold. Again, documentation. You cannot document too much. You really cannot take too many notes or too many pictures. And I am a, big, a very big fan of using a, um, your, your cell phone as a recording device or a, video, or a voice activated uh, recorder of some sort or a video camera. But you can be redundant about this. And I would recommend that when you go in with your team of collections people, that the first thing you do is just document and designate people. You're going to photograph, you're going to write, and to the extent possible to coordinate that with your lists of existing um, uh, records of the objects. Again, more information about it that you can check out later about ways to, to work. You can use a checklist system. You can um, use prose. I like to have prose notes because I find sometimes checklist systems don't give you enough information. And that is the kind of thing that really any institution can create right now. You know, right now, uh, create a, check, a form for disaster recovery, and you can just have that so that you have it ready. While you're waiting to go into the building, prepare a workspace to the extent possible. I know you were talking at the Wolf that you don't really have any workspace, and you don't. But you do have some. You do have, you know, some spaces that could be cleared out. Any any institution will have a space that can be cleared out somewhere because at that stage of the game, you know, the lobby is a reasonable place. Uh, as Francoise says, it has to be locked. It has to be safe. It has to be clear. And um, preferably, if you can get something off-site, that would be great. But if we're looking at a big citywide event, there may not be that space. And of course, you need to outfit it with as much as you can to make the work easier. So another point. As you're beginning to look through your collection, you're going to see certain conditions that you may want to quarantine, things that are infested, things that have very active mold things that you suspect may have a biohazard from sewage or lead or asbestos contamination. For example, in fires, if you have a lot of plastics in your collection, you might want to isolate because you don't know what might be off-gassing from some of those burnt plastics. Removal and handling. Um, again, a key important first step for any part of it. You want to enter cautiously. You want to know where each piece is going before it's moved. You want to have someone in charge of saying, where the where the chain of movement is. You want to use supports and try to keep all the parts together and try to keep the labels with the pieces, but if not, have some waterproof labels. And again, this is something you can just keep in your kits. And we're talking specifically when we talk in general terms about water because water kind of becomes part of every single one of these events ultimately. And for fire damage, you want to leave pieces in place and remove as much soot as possible before moving because the minute you put your hands on one of these sooty objects, you start to drive the soot into the surface. So the technique for vacuuming these pieces prior to their being moved is really important. Large pieces. And I deal a lot with sculpture and monuments on a large scale. Large pieces you're going to need help from people that know how to move things. Um, it's better to leave things in place and just recover the small fragments before getting the, those proper people on site. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the early salvage techniques for a couple of different events. Um, I'm going to run through them a bit quickly, but it's all here and available to be looked at earlier. Early salvage for earthquakes. And earthquakes I are... When I think of earthquakes, I think of a seismic event, but also they are similar to what happens with windstorms or tornadoes or any event where you have a lot of physical damage but not necessarily a lot of water, although again, water comes into play. Um, 
you want to first, there'll be a lot of sorting to be done. And again, once your building is stable, once you're allowed to enter, you want to sort. And what I would suggest is save anything that remotely looks like it's part of the object or part of a, a collection piece. Or in a historic building, that's another story. In a historic building, you really want to save everything because every piece of the building is historic. So you want to just sort everything and keep it. And absolutely, it's essential to have an engineer come in and examine. This is more of the sorting component. The wind and tornado damage is very similar. You want to check, especially with wind and tornadoes, you want to check the surrounding areas. For example, this is um, a, uh, an event that happened at the Huntington Library and Art Gallery in Pasadena in 2012 where a massive windstorm came through. And these are enormous stone urns that were just knocked over because of tree limbs that fell on them. Fragments were as far as 20 feet away, so you want to really comb the area for fragments. If there are unstable tree limbs in the area, you want to get an arborist to take care of that, and you may need to, pres you may need to have stabilization in situ while those trees and limbs are being removed. You also want to look out for blind cracking that renders something unstable. This is again from that same event at the Huntington where sculptures sheared at the feet level so all that was above it was very unstable and it needed to be shored in place before you could even begin to do the recovery work around it. So now we come to the event that we mostly give our attention to, mainly because we have so much of it down here in Florida and because it is really so devastating. I've, I've given a lot of thought to this since I've worked on so many different kinds of events. Short of an event where everything burns, like a museum or a brush fire where it burns an entire collection, a water event is really going to cause the most damage. And um, the first things you want to do is make sure, you know, when water comes in, water goes out. And that receding also creates additional damage. Sometimes you cannot get in early enough to prevent that damage from happening. But if you can, that's one of the things you want to do is see, make sure you don't have your objects swept out to sea or into a river. That's now the other thing is that water is never just water. Uh, uh, Francoise mentioned this also, but one of the things that most... Um, the image that most stayed with me when I heard about the, uh, began to hear about the Hurricane Katrina recovery in New Orleans is that there were balls of poisonous snakes that were floating in the water and landing on historic buildings because they created these masses amongst themselves. So I thought, not only do you, are you standing on the top of your roof, but you have to worry that a ball of snakes or fire ants is going to show up there. So the thing is, you really want to know that that water is not simply water. Think of it as going as walking in the sewer when you go in there for the first time. And of course, it's going to those waters are going to deposit all sorts of materials onto objects and to the building themselves. And you're going to want to be able to deal with these things judiciously, carefully, and thinking about what's most important first. Drying a historic building. Um, Again, you want to ventilate the building and you want to remove the interior moisture as much as possible with a, a ventilation plan that is, that is intended to remove the moisture. You want to do this slowly because you don't want to heat the air too high in, in, in the building because you can ruin the foundation, you can ruin the plaster walls, and you're going to cause, you can cause a lot of detachment of surfaces that wouldn't otherwise detach. There is some excellent written information about how to deal with historic buildings. The Getty has produced a number of documents. And one of the good things I realized as I was preparing this presentation is we're, this is a good moment for disaster planning because there's a lot of good material online. I, we, I have some resources at the end of this presentation, but if you just peruse some of these um, keywords, you'll find good material, but be careful because there's a lot of people now putting stuff online and you want to make sure that you're reading stuff from a reputable institution that has the expertise to provide that information. The wet salvage of objects. You want to set the priorities for salvage, of course. This is my list. There are other lists, but they all sort of um, go in hand in hand. They're pretty, we're, it's a pretty standard way that we deal with this. You want to deal obviously first with the objects that are most fragile, where you can lose the most um, if you don't uh, take care of it. Obviously anything with a painted surface 
is very fragile because when the painted surface is gone, the main material, the main, the main aesthetic of that object is gone. You can just look at this list later. I did not delve into ethnographic collections because my colleague Stephanie Hornbeck did an excellent presentation on this uh, last year, was it, or the year before? In 2012, and that presentation is still online, and she does a very good job of going through how you would deal with sensitive ethnographic materials. I tend to deal a lot with contemporary and modern artworks, and I think a lot of our collections here have contemporary materials, modern materials, um, and those are particularly difficult for one reason, because the aesthetic of these things is entirely related to their pristineness. So how you begin to salvage them is very important. Um, how am I doing for time? Okay. So again, these objects are going to be very, very fragile. Very often you're not going to know what the materials are. And um, you want to be very careful how you take care of them. And again, these are the same um, methods excuse me, that Francoise mentioned in her presentation that you want to blot carefully, that you want to be careful not to touch a softened finish, and that you want to use freezing as a means of, um, of dealing with objects. But the one thing you want to be careful with contemporary pieces is that since so many of them are composite and made of materials that we don't know how they're going to behave if frozen, with those objects in particular, you really do want to consult a professional as soon as possible. Um, again, the basic cleaning. You only want to clean if you can safely do it. You want to remove anything that's grimy or muddy by very, very light rinsing, very light misting. You don't want to use pressure washers or strong hose streams, even on your historic building, even on your major sculpture. I cannot tell you the number of outdoor sculptures that I've seen ruined by people that think after a hurricane the thing to do is call in their facilities department and have them pressure washed. It drives the salts in, it drives the dirt in, and if anybody is uh, foolish enough to then determine that they should be waterproofed, then you really are going to lose your work altogether. Supporting pieces while moving them or drying them is incredibly important. You want to have things that have good air circulation. You would like ideally to have things that are made out of plastics or a non-reactive material, webbing, mesh, um, something that will not transfer dirt or staining. You would like to avoid wood or cardboard and fiber boards, but sometimes you can't. And then the, But you can use them if you cover them with plastic sheet or you cover them with Tyvek, you're good to go. And you want fa fans circulating air, but you don't want that air blowing directly at an object. You want it sort of blowing in the room so the air is circulating in the room, but not hitting the pieces directly. Blotting. Again, blotting is um, um, a good way to get rid of excess moisture on materials particularly organic materials, but it's the, 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 the preferred method for getting the excess water that's trapped into a surface. Blotting is something that involves dabbing. You press lightly, and you want to examine the underside of your blotter paper or paper towels to make sure that you're not removing color. And if you are removing color, you really want to stop doing that. However, if you blot something where the color is bleeding, you may want to blot where the color is bleeding to just stop that bleeding. Again, I think by these stages, you should be in contact with a conservator that could be helping you out. And what I think is it's most important for you to know these things as a very early stage of the recovery, but avail yourself of professionals to the extent possible because so much damage is done when the incorrect approach is taken, but if you're blotting carefully and you realize, you know, on a sticky surface that you need to stop, you'll be okay for the most part. Uh, a lot has been said about freezing. This is the chest freezer in our studio here in Miami. It's a lovely freezer. You can see we could freeze about five objects. But it's a really good way to deal with many materials. So as uh, Francoise said, I agree that you really should Know those resources in this area as, as quickly as possible. Freezing is also good if you have um, infestation of certain types of collections. Again, if colors run, you want to blot gently. 
You can use a hair dryer on a cool or low setting to gently air dry the surface, letting the air go perpendicular to the surface. Um, no, not perpendicular. Uh, parallel to the surface. You don't want the air blowing at the piece, you want it going across the piece. This is a, um, I put up this object because this is the kind of object that would vex anyone and where you'd really want a conservator to deal with it. This is a uh, work by Bloomberg that involves a very sticky resin plastic co cover over a lithograph in a steel frame. Um, this piece is going to have needs that are conflicting. This is exactly the kind of work that you would really want a conservator to deal with because that heavy plastic on the surface is going to stick to the paper beneath it. So you're going to want to stand it up initially, but if it's really saturated, you're going to want to lay it down, and you absolutely wouldn't want to take a soft plastic material off of um, its frame by yourselves. Anything that's soft or pliable, such as costumes or toys, anything that has a shape that will be lost, you're going to want to pad out with absorbent material and keep changing that material. Again, when you're cleaning an object that's made out of one material, it's much safer and easier than when you're cleaning an object that is of composite materials. And, and to the extent that the pieces are that complicated, um, my feeling is that even though there's a, the whole list of how you deal with these works and you deal with the most fragile things first, if you're dealing with untrained people or volunteers, I recommend that you set those pieces aside and deal with the simple ones first so people get their sea legs uh, working on things that they can't damage easily. It's, it's tough to give a volunteer a very complicated project as their first project. So even if these are not the key pieces, have them start with that until you can have a professional um, who knows how to do this direct their work more directly. Just some information on wood objects that you can read later. The main thing here is that sometimes wood gets a white bloom that is not necessarily mold and you don't have to deal with it right away. It's just the varnish blanching and that can be reversed. Painted surfaces. This is one thing you should never have a non-professional touch. And mold outbreaks. You may recognize some of these pieces. Um, if mold outbreaks happen, and they will, um, you want to keep your room clean. Um, during Hurricane Katrina, the, um, the uh, Preservation Society of New Orleans handed people buckets, gloves, and bleach to clean their walls. And though you can clean parts of your historic, of your non-historic surfaces with um, a chlorine bleach. You should never touch a historic surface with that. However, it is useful for cleaning things like ducts, like ductwork, um, cleaning uh, floorboards, that sort of thing, if you're not talking about a historic building. When you're doing wet salvage for inorganic materials, you want to dry the metals as quickly as possible or they're going to corrode. And when you have corroding metal, like this is a, an, an example of a historic staircase at Vizcaya after the hurricanes of 2005, the corroding materials inside um, actually broke the marble. But you want to be careful about corrosion removal because for contemporary work, sometimes a corroded surface is the aesthetic. So you want to be careful not to s remove corrosion. You just want to dry things and let a conservator decide if that's a corrosion that should be removed or not. I'm going to just go. Again, very fragile surfaces. Anything that's crumbling should not be rinsed. Another thing, uh, and this was uh, a big thing that happened during Sandy, large sculptures that were being fabricated in Red Hook when water came into these fabrication studios Later, these pieces had to be completely refabricated because even though they were able to get the salt water out, if they had residual salts within the sculptures because of weep holes, that's going to come out later and really um, affect uh, the work itself. And this is a, a sculpture that is installed that salts got into the interior and it's bleeding through. I'm going to skip through because I have a lot of stuff. I'm going to do a little bit on fire salvage and then I know I need to end. Um, 
objects in a fire are going to be either charred or they're going to be covered in soot. Soot is nothing more than deposited smoke and the result of incomplete combustion. It's really toxic. So you want to be very careful when you work with it. I encourage everyone to read the publication um, that was done after the Huntington Library fire. And even though the techniques have changed since that, this was in 1985, um, there are so many good lessons to be learned. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit. The, the most important thing about soot damage is that you want to, when you, you know, if you had a fire and you've got objects, you want to vacuum as much as possible before you move anything. So leave your pile of objects in place and vacuum. And you want to use a vacuum with a HEPA filter. And you want to make sure that vacuum hovers over the pieces and doesn't touch it. Like you don't use a brush attachment because drawing that brush across the surface will drive the soot in. Later, you can actually use a brush in further stages. But those initial stages you want to do without brushing or anything. And you want to use a vacuum with a HEPA filter. You can even retrofit a vacuum with like different hoses to hit the crevices. And I think I should be wrapping up here even though I have a few... Oh, I'm good. Um, once you are dealing with a soot event and you can actually, you've done your initial vacuuming of the objects and you've moved your objects and you can actually start working on them after vacuuming, there are some excellent dry methods that you can use and you want to do as many methods of dry cleaning before you actually get to any liquid because the minute you, the liquid hits, you can no longer do any dry cleaning. But removing soot is extremely satisfying because it works a lot of the time if done properly. For example, this is a piece we uh, dealt with a, a big fire in a private museum in Texas. It was a Western art museum, and um, the entire collection got covered in soot. This is, you know, done properly. This is a very porous ceramic, and we were able to get it completely cleaned. In conclusion, again, um, you always want to put safety first and you're going to need to keep evaluating safety because it's not only a question of safety of entering the building, but you want to keep making sure you're wearing the right gloves, that you're cleaning your masks, that you're not dealing with anything toxic and hazardous, and that very uh, able project manager will able to direct you in that um, regard. And here are a number of different resources. I found this Studio Protector, The Artist's Guide to Emergencies, which is wonderful for contemporary and modern art and for individual artists. And these uh, National Park Service conservagrams about disaster recovery are really good. And um, thank you. I'm happy to take questions or anything.